Hi everyone, welcome to this new session of CF Level 2. Today we will be covering the remaining portion of the second reading of contingent claims from derivatives topic. Now, in the first reading, we looked at all things related to the binomial model, the one period model, two period model, the arbitrage, and the interest rate options using those binomial models. The focus of this last session of derivatives is going to be solely on the Black Scholes model. Now, let me be very clear right at the start of this session. This model throughout your syllabus, all the topics, they have what is known as a learning objective statement, a heading which tells you whether this topic is relevant for you from a conceptual standpoint or from calculation standpoint. And throughout this entire topic, the LOS in your syllabus reads describe or interpret. At no point are you required by the syllabus to know the calculations of any of these elements. So this session is going to be very theoretical, but make sure you have a good understanding because in derivatives so far all the derivatives that we've done almost everything you had to understand logically you could understand that by way of some calculation or some example but you won't have that luxury for the topics we are about to discuss so theory questions of derivatives very likely to come from the sections that we are going to cover today so the focus is black schools model and the option greeks let's start with the black schools model so here I have with me the equations of the BSM model for call options and for put options. Now outright when you look at it, these equations look like they are complicated and they have some nuance to them. But in essence, this is not very different from the binomial model. If you remember in binomial model, what we did was in order to calculate the value of the call option, the process was simple whatever the future expected prices were i compared them with some sort of spot price so over here also what i'm trying to say is that whatever your exercise price is there would be probabilities involved i cover all the elements don't worry about it but your exercise price compared with your current spot price of the underlying so basically this model says that a call option can be replicated by way of buying stocks with borrowed money. Now over here, some people might get confused and they might think, how is this replicating call? It will all make sense. If you remember in the last reading, we looked at a topic focused on how we use arbitrage in case of binomial model. Over there, in order to do the arbitrage, we had to buy the stock and we also had to borrow whatever money was needed. And the missing element was the call option itself. It's pretty much the same thing here. Now, these have a few elements that need to be understood. First is this. This is simply continuous compounded. risk free rate so instead of using any particular rate we use the risk free rate and in the bsm model we use the continuous compounding instead of our regular compound interest so that's the first thing that has to be known the second thing to note is this value and d1 now if you remember in case of the example we did for arbitrage using binomial models we did a calculation to decide how many shares should I actually buy. ND1 is nothing but that. This is number of stocks that you have to buy in this particular transaction so that you are able to replicate the uh, payoffs of a call option. So ND1 is nothing but number of stocks. ND2. This is the probability that option will expire in the money. This simply means what is the chances that at maturity my option will have a positive payoff. In the money simply means that it will generate some sort of payoff 
at the end. Now that we know all of the unique elements of this entire equation, the next thing is how exactly is this equation giving us any information about call option or any option for that matter. Now, if you remember when we did forwards and futures, if I needed value of forward, value of forward used to be spot rate at any time t minus whatever the forward rate is divided by rate t minus t. I used to bring the forward rate back to wherever I wanted to do valuation. Here also I am doing sort of the same thing. I have an expiry uh, price, the exercise price, which would be applicable only at the majority of the contract. I have a spot price at the same time where I am doing the valuation. So if I want to do valuation at time 20, spot price is also at time 20. So call at zero, spot also at zero, which means they both are representing the same time gap. So what I'm doing is I'm replicating the same concept, but in case of option. However, instead of just having this, I have added the element of probability as well by way of ND2, which is the probability that the option will expire in the money. Another way of understanding this same idea is if I say call option is equal to e to the power minus rt. So I take this value common. So I've taken this value common, which means everything inside, I'll discount it using this continuous compounded rate. Spot rate e to the power rt n d1 minus x n d2. This might be slightly easier to understand if the first one was confusing. What I'm saying here is, the payoff that I will have from a call option in the future. So at any point in time, let's say today is time zero. After one year, the payoff that I will have will be the spot price at time T, whatever the spot price is at that moment. So spot price at time T is simply spot price at time zero e to the power RT. If you remember in case of forwards or futures, Future price was, the forward price was calculated in the same way. Forward price was nothing but spot price taken up by way of compounding. So this is simply saying spot price at time t. And this is exercise price. All I'm doing is spot price, exercise price. Whatever the difference is with the probability of me ending up with an in the money option. That is going to be my payoff at some future time and that payoff is being discounted to give me the value of call option. So it's not that different from the binomial. So I hope now if you want you can either understand it using this equation or using the first equation. The core idea is you should know what all the components are and what this equation is trying to convey to you. Actual calculations, if you get calculations from this, every element in this equation will be given to you. So the question will say you have a spot price ND1, ND2, expiry rate, uh, time would be given, everything would be given, you just plug in the values. That's why calculation is not the major focus of this entire discussion. Now, once we have all of this out of the way, the one thing that we have is N minus D1 or N minus D2. This is nothing but so n minus d2 is same thing as writing as 1 minus n d2 so this is just a notation that we use now what's the purpose why exactly do we have this notation if you think logically the prices at which my call option will be in the money are also the prices at which put option will be out of the money because put option for put option the price has to be lower and for the call option price has to be higher. So at the price points where call option is in the money, put option is out of money. So if my probability of call option being in the money is 60%, the probability of put option being in the money will be 1 minus 60%. Hence we denote it with n minus d2 whenever we replicate this in terms of put option. So I hope all of this makes sense. 
Now, aside from just this, you also have assumptions. There are assumptions of this model which are very important because these assumptions, they ensure that this model is not used everywhere in all circumstances. Rather, this is a very theoretical model that often is not used in the real world. The assumptions, instead of noting them down as six points, within this equation, I'll help you understand what the assumptions are. So the first assumption is about spot price and as such about the entire equation. The first assumption says that the underlying on which we are doing the valuation, it is assumed to have a log normal distribution. Which means it is continuous in nature. So if you remember in case of binomial model, we had time 0, then we had time 1 and the price was moving from 100 all the way to 125. It was not a gradual move, it was a jump. The first assumption of BSM model is jumps are not possible. The price, if it has to increase, it will increase in a gradual, continuous manner over the entire time. So first thing it is saying is that prices follow a long normal distribution and they are continuous in nature. The price movement is going to be continuous from one time to the next to the next, so on forever. For that reason, we use continuous compounding everywhere in the BSM model. The second assumption is that this risk-free rate, this is constant and known, which means this risk-free rate will not change. You can borrow and lend the money at this risk-free rate itself. Aside from that, one assumption is focused on this D1 and D2 calculations. Now, these calculations are based on volatility of the underlying, but these calculations require complex financial models, which are beyond the scope of the exam. So for the exam, knowing the meaning of these two is enough, but know that these use the volatility of underlying in some way or the other to try to estimate what the value should be. The assumption of the BSM model is that that volatility is also constant and known, which means volatility is not changing from time to time. We know what the volatility is and that would remain constant, which doesn't apply this model in the real world as such, because in the real world, you have recession period where the risk increases and then you have growth period where the risk is relatively low. So volatility keeps changing, but this model says that is not possible. Aside from this, there are also some other assumptions that make this model not very usable in the real world. One of the core ones is just the fact that it assumes that the markets are frictionless. You have no taxes, no brokerage costs, no transaction costs, none of that, which happens in the real world. Aside from that, there is also an assumption that all options are European, which means this model does not follow any sort of American options. It has to be options with a fixed maturity and exercise option only at the maturity. So only European options can be valued or analyzed using the BSM model. The last assumption is that all the yields are also continuously compounded. Now, now this is something that outright explaining would be slightly difficult. But aside from the BSM model, your syllabus also focuses on how we modify this model to suit different assets. So this is a case of, let's say an equity stock, which has no dividend component. But what if we are dealing with a share that pays dividend on a regular basis? For that, we'll make a few tweaks. Then we might even discuss it for swaps, for FRAs, for interest rates. So all of those discussions will have slight tweaks to this entire model. The logic of this entire model will stay just as it is right now. So with the basics out of the way, now all we have to do for BSM model is to see how we modify it slightly to fit different kinds of options.